Welcome to the podcast from St. Barnabas Lutheran Church in Cary, Illinois. I'm Pastor Sarah Wilson, and we'll be posting gospel lessons and a sermon for you to enjoy each week. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. You'll be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus starts by saying, But I say to you that listen as though we can already see people tuning out and turning away. So be honest, how long did you listen to him? I mean seriously listen, as you would listen to directions on how to get to the emergency room if your child was bleeding. Did you seriously listen beyond do good to those who hate you and pray for those who abuse you? Maybe, maybe we do. So when's the last time you prayed for the members of Al-Qaeda or ISIS? When's the last time you prayed for the lost children who let themselves be used as suicide bombers? When have you prayed for those angry Americans that slaughter school children? We pray that those guys are stopped. We don't pray for them. And how about when Jesus gets face-to-face and specific, as in offer the other cheek, not just turn the other cheek, but offer the other cheek to someone who strikes you. Or if someone takes your coat, let him have your shirt. And by the time he says, if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again, how many of us are seriously listening at all and not smiling at the sheer unworldly folly of it or muttering, fat chance? When Pastor Sarah and I talked about this passage last week, I called it the charter of the holy fools. Yet we know, we know, this is pretty close to the heart of the gospel's call. If we were asked about these verses by an incredulous unbeliever or a blunt confirmation student who thought they sounded crazy, we could all say, yeah, yeah, but you know, they really are the commands of Jesus. Pretty much how he lived, how he wants us to live. We know the words. They're as familiar as the Lord's Prayer. They've become Proverbs. Turn the other cheek. Give the shirt off your back. But I usually hear turn the other cheek as a joke or a taunt. And giving the shirt off your back is usually heard as rare praise, rare praise for an unusually generous individual. That guy would give you the shirt off his back, unlike everyone else. But I think we know that Jesus intends a little more than that, something to be a little more common among his disciples. My guess is that the experience of listening to this passage is a little like listening to somebody else being given directions. We understand the words, but we don't expect to have to do much about them. I think it's only when Jesus concludes that first section with, do to others as you would have them do to you, that we perk up with that vital connection of thought and action. Hey, it's the golden rule. Do unto others. I can do that. Give and take. Tit for tat. Scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. Don't step on my toes. I won't step on yours. (laughs) Sure, I can do it. Piece of cake. So now we can ask, how, 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 after all those radical, sacrificial, self-forgetting demands, how in the world can Jesus say something so bland and obvious as the golden rule? Or maybe we should ask, 
Why do we imagine we understand it? My father gave me, when I was in high school, a really thick, broad metal ruler, painted gold, with this verse on it, do to others as you would have them do to you. Golden rule, little parental wit. But, but I didn't use it much. I, uh, <clears throat> I prefer those cheap plastic rulers with the holes punched in them. Remember, you could snap them into your binder and have the groove along the middle. Why, why, you ask? Because you could cross two of them, fasten them together with one of those brass paper fasteners, rig a thick rubber band on the cross piece, and you have a kind of crossbow, you can fire pencils down, uh, in study hall warfare. <clears throat> well, what a maniac! Bleh. I was soon caught with this, this thing and deservedly punished, and I had to listen in great detail to just how stupid and dangerous this was and how lucky I was that I didn't put somebody's eye out. Pretty grim wake-up call. I mean, how would you feel if, if your stupidity had blinded somebody? Actually, my crossbow was so unstable, you should just fly apart. I'm lucky I didn't put my own eye out. And most of the time, I just ended up burying the pencil lead in my left hand. But that should have told me something right there. Did I like being speared with that pencil? No. Would I want some fool to put my eye out? No. Then I shouldn't do it or risk doing it to somebody else. So maybe that's what my father was trying to tell me, the golden rule, right? Well, yeah, in a negative, self-protective way, don't like it, don't do it. We actually use the golden rule that way. We throw it at each other that way. Yo, back off. You see me doing that to you? Don't do it to me. It's one of the natural ways we levy a judgment in defiance of that other proverbial and incredible command in this passage, don't judge and you will not be judged. We use the golden rule as a rough and ready judgment, kind of along the lines of live and let live. But once we get there, can we really convince ourselves that the gospel of Jesus Christ comes down to live and let live? Let's take a closer look. When Jesus says this in the middle of so many radical, sacrificial, self-forgetting demands, he doesn't put it negatively. It's a positive summons. Do to others. Go out and do to others. And here's the key, the part we think we understand, the unspecified qualification we think we can fill in without his help, as you would have them do to you. Why does that seem simple and obvious to us? What would we have done to us? Not once, not just today, not just in one situation, but always as a constant sentence of treatment forever. Or put it this way, what would we want in the end as our final lot, as a final judgment? What would we want handed out to us for good? Always. Jesus has the faith in us, the miraculous and miracle-making faith in us to believe that if pushed to discover what we want, we will find beneath the defensive, self-protective strategies of our nature the memory of something better, a yearning for mercy and the gift of grace rather than strict justice and harsh punishment. He believes we would want grace and mercy done to us. So, go and do likewise. As Jesus uses it, the golden rule isn't obvious, and it isn't an oddity in the sacrificial summons. In fact, coming on the heels of those first verses, it's almost a deeper shock. You think what he's been telling you so far is incredible? Well, here's something else you can chew on. We've got a reason to do that. Buried beneath our sin and our justice and our self-justifications, we have a reason to follow him on this sacrificial path because, in the end, this is really what we want. In the end, unless we're crazy or arrogant enough to think God has nothing to nail us for, we do want only mercy, grace, love. And now we've reached the point in this sermon where if you're still listening to me, you might be thinking, I'm sounding a lot less realistic and sensible than I sounded at the beginning. So let's step back and look at this from a different direction. We might want what Jesus wants in the end. We're not at the end. And here and now, we want a lot of other things too. They may seem little to Jesus, 
Or they may seem selfish to Jesus, but they're pretty important to us. Little things like safety, like not being hit twice or more if we can help it, like keeping a coat when it's 15 below zero in the American Midwest so we don't have to buy one tomorrow, like our car back if it's stolen so we can get to work. And if we take Jesus seriously and we take the sinful world we live in seriously, we are going to feel a war in our nature, a war between our nature and the gospel. I'll put it the old-fashioned way. We feel our sinful rebellion against God because we don't want to do this stuff. And it's coming in the most hidden way and the most powerful way, not from our desire for evil things, but from our desire for good things. We feel the friction of the gospel and the world. We feel why the gospel will never be at home on earth. Back when I was serving as a pastor, I read about a little town somewhere. I think it was, uh, had to be among our southern brethren, you know, down where the Bible belt buckles, uh, that voted to replace all, of the, all the city ordinances, all the laws they had, all the regulations, all the town regulations with, with, with the Bible. Just replace them all with the Bible. The Bible became the town's only law book. You can have a hilarious afternoon digging up Old Testament commands that I would love to see them try to put into practice. You know, they'd have to bring back stoning for one thing right away. But, but I got to wondering how exactly they're going to they're enforce the pretty clear commands in this passage. Would they require people to offer the other cheek when they got slugged by the town bully? Would they forbid business people who were robbed to even ask for their goods back? Would the police arrest you if you didn't give away your shirt. But of course, what are the odds they were even thinking about this passage when they made that decision, thinking about the radical nature of the gospel? A million to one? A billion to one? How about no chance at all? Of course they weren't thinking about this passage. They wanted something more punitive, like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, a punitive order backed by God, and the, pre the pretense it had anything at all to do with Jesus. It's a recipe for hypocrisy. You have to fool yourself. You have to lie to yourself about how radical the gospel is, about what the world is like, about how perfect you can be. Now, there have been Christian groups who have seriously tried to order their lives by passages like this, the loving submission of the radical gospel. Uh, it's one of the motives behind the monastic movement. Um, but also groups like the Amish, the Mennonites, the Quakers, some of the First Baptists. But to do it, to do it, they felt they had to drop out of society and, and huddle together with, with the like-minded and similarly committed. So they would, they would refuse to serve in, in the armed forces, um, legislatures, any, any arena where order or obligations had to be enforced. Uh, that's why Luther never went all the way with these people because he felt it was a matter of how do we protect people in society? Protection. Some of these groups were persecuted, and they, they were heroically nonviolent and non-resisting. So, so they're, they're, they're harder to dismiss. But in their lives as a whole, if, if you were a cynical person, uh, you might suspect they, they depend a lot on other people to protect them, or at least their surrounding environment. Uh, you might suspect that they manage to find ways to look after their own interests, and I, I suspect you'd have a point. And if you ask them, okay, but are you really loving all those outsiders, all the people outside your community, your enemies, or just your neighbors? I'm sure they'd say yes. Uh, they certainly don't want to do any harm. But it's as though they're ignoring their neighbors and their enemies and everyone as much as they can, just ignoring them. It's like, it's like a really mild, benign way of completely misunderstanding Jesus. Not being in the world in a loving way, but not being in the world at all. But let's look at a personal and a more painful way, a malicious way of misunderstanding Jesus. Pretty early in our, in our service as pastors, we got a call on a Friday night from the wife of a young couple in the congregation who asked if we could, we could come out to their farm right away. Um, her sister had come to her, come running to her for shelter. Uh, she'd run away with her kids again from her abusive husband. And could we come help convince her not to go back again? Just to make things more interesting, the abusive husband was the son of a pastor. 
the pastor we knew. Okay. So we drove out there, and, and the sister, she's visibly beaten. She's jittery. Um, but she's come away with, with pictures of earlier injuries, police reports, hospital stays. This is going on a long time. But things she never really pushed to act on legally because she always returned, always returned to the abuse. I think this time she made the break because he'd gone after the kids. She could immediately see that harm was intolerable on them. She couldn't see it was intolerable to her. We all spent the night trying to make her see that, no, she'd done a good thing here. She'd done a good thing, not a bad thing. At times, the conversation would have, I mean, it could have come right out of the manuals. You know, she'd blame herself for being late with supper or not cleaning the house well enough. So maybe she maybe she'd deserved the beatings. Yeah. Well, we eventually managed to convince her, no, you're right. You're right to get yourself and your kids out of there. You're right. Uh, we convinced her for a time. Uh, just to end this, her story, uh, she did go back to him. And the last time I saw the couple, uh, they were standing together at some church function, and she looked like she was in a shell, kind of looked numb. And he looked uh, just nasty and just radiating, just radiating aggression and hostility. I mean, he's the guy you don't want sitting down next to you. And, you know. um, but anyway, after that first night, next day, I get an outraged phone call from her father-in-law and mother-in-law, uh, this pastor I knew, and his wife. How could I? How could I, as a pastor, how could I, as a Christian, not tell this woman to go home and fulfill her sacred marriage vows to love, honor, and obey her husband? I asked them if they knew about the beatings. Didn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Her duty is to go home and, and keep those vows. She should turn the other cheek, you know, the way Jesus says. Well, before I hung up, I told them they should give that lecture to their son. I think it's too little to call that a malicious misunderstanding of what Jesus says here. It's almost a demonic perversion of it, turning the word of life into an instrument of evil. I don't see Jesus as wanting us to leave the world or hide from it. I don't see Jesus as wanting us to be the world's doormats or punching bags. I see him calling for a community of disciples that's an active force for good in the world. Nonviolent, non-grasping, unselfish force. An active force of goodness and mercy and sacrifice. But I don't think it's a simple or an easy thing to be that force in this world. All the things I've raised in protest at the seeming folly of Jesus' words, are rooted in what we know of the truth of our sinful world, where doing good often means choosing the lesser evil and living with it, where people need to be protected. But that in itself tells us we do, we do want more than that in the end. We really do want mercy and grace to win, to be the final words, even if we imperfect blind, struggling creatures can't always be the ones to speak them. But Jesus does. And the only final victory so far in this struggle is his cross, hardly the sign of earthly success and harmony, symbol really of the friction we live in, the friction between the gospel and the world. We need to keep coming to a place like this together under his cross to hear that higher call because no order we design, no possible human community could call us and get us that far. This is his light in the world. We may only be able to show a little of that light before the rest of our nature rebels, justifiably rebels as far as we can see, for every good reason. But when it shines from us a little, we show his force in the world, and that active force is the light of salvation. Amen. Thanks for listening today. We hope this message helped bring you closer to God in a new way. You can learn more about our church at www.stbarnabas-carry.com or visit us in person at 8901 Cary Algonquin Road in Cary, Illinois. Our worship services are each Sunday at 8 and 1030 a.m. God's blessings on your week.